Thanks, Christian, and and um, I'm happy to be here today. Hello, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking the American Red Cross and especially Christian for organizing this talk on such an important topic. Um, and I'd like to start um, by abusing your patience by <laughs> and giving two plugs. Uh, the first for uh, the 2019 edition of the International Review of the Red Cross on Children in War, which I was lucky enough to work on, and I can share a link to it in the chat later. Um, there you can find a lot of in-depth information on the topics I'm going to, to touch on today. And the second thing I'd like to plug are the ICRC's updated commentaries to the Geneva Conventions. Um, just last year, we published in print the convention on the third, the commentary on the third Geneva Convention, which contains um, protections for children detained in prisoner of war camps. And currently, my team is taking stock of how the law and practice has developed since 1949, um, and how states have implemented the fourth Geneva Convention, which deals a lot with children, and that is coming soon, well, relatively soon in 2024, but it's given me the chance to think a lot about the topic of children in war, um, and I'll try to weave in some of those things today. So after giving those two plugs, I'd like to get into the, the substance of the, the talk today on children in war, um, which will be divided roughly into two parts. The first looking at international law and the protections for children, um, specifically international humanitarian law, and the second on um, some of the consequences armed conflicts have for children based on some of the ICRC's observation and, and its work. And then there'll be time for questions. I know the American Red Cross and others have been very active in working on protections for children in armed conflict and on uh, reduction of civilian casualties. And I know that there'll be some interesting comments and questions. Um, so I'm looking forward to those and I wanna make sure we have time for them. Uh, one of the things that, that I was really thinking about in preparing for this was the disturbing sort of shift in public perception that there's been in recent years where children who fall into certain categories or who are labeled things like migrant or girl in some circumstances or violent extremists can be at risk of facing lower standards of protection, lower implementation of the existing legal protections. And one of the questions that, that we asked a lot when we were working on the edition of the review on children in conflict is, is how, in a time when it's sometimes politically unpopular, to provide children with all the protections that they're morally and legally entitled to in armed conflict, how do we ensure that their rights and their needs are met? Um, so to, to start us thinking about that, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the international law as it relates to, to children in armed conflict and public, inter public international law generally contains a lot of detailed and pretty strong rules protecting children and international humanitarian law specifically contains robust rules protecting children in armed conflict in the 1949 Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols and also in customary international humanitarian law rules that are applicable in both international and non-international armed conflict. And under international humanitarian law, children are doubly protected. They're first entitled to general protection as civilians, and they're also entitled to special respect and protection by virtue of their status as children. Um, and this is enshrined in customary international humanitarian law. In the ICRC customary IHL study, this is rule 135. Um, and it's important to note that, that most of the suffering caused by armed conflict could be avoided or at least ameliorated if there were greater respect for the existing law. Um, and this could be done through a greater focus on implementation in 
trainings and dissemination and incorporation into rules of engagement and codes of conduct, as well as in domestic legal systems um, and through other measures. But it's important to, to emphasize that the existing rules are already pretty protective for children. And those rules under international humanitarian law can be divided roughly into four main groups. The first is the rules that govern the recruitment and use of children in armed conflicts. This includes the rules prohibiting the recruitment and use of children by armed forces and by armed groups, and also the rules that specify that even where children have been recruited in violation of this prohibition, they nevertheless uh, do not lose their status as children. So for example, if captured, they must continue to be treated as children. And there are some differences in obligations surrounding the age of recruitment, the minimum age of recruitment under different legal instruments that we'll get into in a moment. But, but this is roughly speaking the first group of, of rules protecting children under IHL. And the second is rules that govern children's access to education. And these include rules that protect schools as civilian objects and protect students and teachers as civilians so that they cannot be the object of an attack. Um, they can't be targeted. And also this category includes rules that oblige parties to armed conflict to facilitate access to education. So parties to armed conflict, armed conflict must make efforts to ensure that children can continue to go to school. And this obligation is particularly strong in situations of occupation and in non-international armed conflicts where the second additional protocol implies uh, where non-state armed groups may have greater control over territory. The third category of rules that protect children under IHL are the rules that govern the treatment of children who are deprived of liberty, or in other words, children who are detained. Um, these include the rules that the, the obligation to detain children separately from adults, except where they're detained with their families. Um, and also, the rules governing age sensitive treatment. So children who are detained are entitled to specific access to education. They're entitled to access to recreational activities and to age appropriate nutrition and, and measures like that. Um, the fourth group is of rules governing the treatment of children who are separated from their families. And so the, these include um, rules obliging the parties to on conflict to look after children who are separated from their families um, to meet their needs. And also the obligation to reunite these children with their families. And this is where the ICRC and national societies like the American Red Cross do a lot of work um, on restoring family links. Oh, sorry. And here, um, these are the four main categories. There are also complementary rules under, um, under human rights law, and these can be found in um, instruments at the international level, such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, as I'm speaking to a largely American audience here, I should note that um, the US is the only UN member state who's not a party, who hasn't ratified the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, but it is a signatory and it's a member of the optional protocol on the involvement of children in armed conflict. Um, but these are just two of the instruments that operate on, on the international or multilateral level to protect children. Um, at the regional level, there are also instruments that contain um, protections for children, including protections during armed conflict, such as the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. And there are also other standards and guidelines, such as political commitments, um, that the ICRC will regularly incorporate into its dialogue with relevant authorities. Um, there are three of them listed here on the slide, uh, including the Paris Principles, 
and commitment to protect children unlawfully recruited or used by armed groups, the Safe Schools Declaration, which protects schools and universities from being used by armed forces, um, and the Vancouver Principles on Peacekeeping and the Prevention of Child Recruitment. And so having mentioned these, um, these legal instruments that, that protect the human rights of children, um, I'd like to just highlight two of the developments that come out of human rights law that have increased protection for children during armed conflict. And the first of these is the principle of the best interests of the child, which appears in the Conventions of the right, on the Rights of the Child. Um, you might be familiar with this. It's also often relied on in domestic law, um, notably in, in custody decisions for children, but also in international law and in um, in the rules protecting children during armed conflict to ensure that measures taken on their behalf are in their best interest. Um, the second development I'd like to highlight that comes from human rights law is that children should be considered primarily as victims of offenses under international law, not only as perpetrators, which is found in the Paris principles and commitments to protect children unlawfully recruited or used by armed groups. So having talked about these, now I'd like to just go through with you um, some of, or another way that international humanitarian law and human rights law can interact. And this is on the, um, the rules governing recruitment and use of children in armed forces and armed groups. And perhaps responds a little bit to one of the comments I see already in the, in the comment box about, um, well, who is a child? under international law. And so here on this slide, you'll see that there are several treaties in human rights land in IHL that have set a minimum age of recruitment for children. Um, and they're listed sort of in order of most to least protective, although the, the ILO Convention on the Worst Forms of Child Labor is, is sort of out of order at the end there. Um, from instruments that protect children under 18 from being recruited to instruments that protect children 15 and under. And um, another way to think about these legal instruments, which contain different standards of who's a child for the purpose of the pro prohibition of recruitment of children um, is in chronological order. Uh, and that way we can kind of see that in 1977, when the additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions were concluded, the minimum age of recruitment was set at 15. Then subsequently in 1989, when the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child was concluded, the age for compulsory recruitment, com compulsory recruitment was raised to 18, while the, age, the minimum age for voluntary re recruitment remained at 15 under that instrument. And then even later in 2000, the optional protocol on the involvement of children in armed conflict raised that minimum age again for voluntary recruitment to 16 and incorporated strict rules on how children between the ages of 16 and 18 who are voluntary recruited voluntarily recruited can be used, notably that they should not be used for uh, participation in hostilities. Um, so that would allow things like enrollment in a military academy, but not necessarily being used on the front lines. And so if we look at it through that chronological lens, you can consider that the trend is towards raising the minimum age of recruitment to 18, even though still under different legal instruments and in different territories, um, the minimum age may depend on the law applicable in that given territory. Here I'd also like to note that, that some of those instruments prohibiting, prohibiting the recruitment and use of children in armed conflict also apply um, during non-international armed conflict. And I'd like to just say a few words about non-state armed groups as non-international armed conflict is the, the predominant form of conflict in the world today. And the ICRC estimates there's roughly 6,000 non-state armed groups in the world. And they represent 
they and this presents a, a range of risks towards children that are not necessarily re related to recruitment, such as the multiplication of front lines and the greater strain on resources as different groups put pressure on the population for support, but also represents a, an increased risk of recruitment. And it's important to note that this is prohibited under many international instruments. Um, and this prohibition extends not only to recruitment to be fighters, but also recruitment to perform supporting tasks, such as acting as spies or guards or scouts, um, recruitment as sex slaves or, or uh, to work as cooks, for example. And so it's important to highlight that the ICRC's dialogue on IHL with non-state armed groups is essential to raise awareness of these obligations that non-state armed groups also have the obligation not to recruit children. Um, and this dialogue is very important even though it's sometimes difficult and can require adapted approaches. Even where these rules are violated and, and children are unlawfully recruited, it's important to remember also that they remain children and that uh, parties to armed conflict have some specific obligations towards children who are associated with armed forces and armed groups. And these include um, taking measures to support the recovery and reintegration of such children, uh, the fact that these children should not be prosecuted prosecuted simply for their association with an armed group, um, that when these children are accused of acts that are crimes, they should be primarily treated as victims and alternatives to criminal proceedings should be sought where possible. And where that's not possible, they should be tried in the context of um, juvenile, a juvenile justice framework. And this can be really concretely seen when former um, child soldiers are given the opportunity to speak. And in the edition of the review that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, there you can find the testimony of former child soldiers in the Democratic Re Republic of Congo. And what you can quite clearly see in their testimony is the cost of the stigmatization they face when they, when they return to their communities or when they attempt to reintegrate in other communities because they're not able to return. And uh, the ICRC works with these children um, to ease their reintegration into the community. And one other thing that comes out in that in their testimony in that edition is the need to provide real alternatives to re-recruitment. So the ICRC provides professional training in addition to helping them reestablish re contact with their families and, and, and other support. Um, but we should keep in mind that states and parties to armed conflict are the, are the primary duty holders in this respect and that humanitarian organizations are stepping in to, to fill the gap. So having gone through some of the legal protections for children in international law, I'd like to now talk about some of the consequences armed conflicts have on children, some of the impact it has. Um, we touched on some of these in, in the context of the laws that are designed to protect them, but I'll highlight a few more based on the ICRC's ob observations in its op operations and uh, in its and based on its communications with children through focus groups and in its needs assessments. So the ICRC is not a child protection agency per se, but about 40% or so of the people we serve in our protection and assistance activities are children. So we have a wealth of experience working with children and, and it's important to keep in mind that they're not mini adults, that they've got distinct needs and face particular risks. And it's important that they're consulted in designing programs designed in, in designing programs that are that are for their benefit, um, especially since they often have a differing perspective on what their needs are compared to adults. And one example of this is frequently seen in among displaced populations where Adults will often 
prioritize uh, programs that are designed to facilitate reintegration into, uh, in, that are designed to facilitate return to their place of origin where children will preference activities that are designed to help their integration into the host community. It's also important to keep in mind that children are not a monolithic group um, and their vulnerabilities may manifest differently in light of gender, ethnic or cultural background, disability, religion, or other social economic factors. The ACRC estimates that today one in 10 children are affected by armed conflict worldwide and the number of children that's been affected by conflict is, is rising and has been rising since the end of the Cold War. In the past decade, it's up about 300%. The number of children who are killed or wounded or maimed in war is disproportionate um, compared to the, to the number of casualties overall. And children who are living in context affected by armed conflict are twice as likely to die before the age of five. These vulnerabilities um, that arise during armed conflict are exacerbated by factors like climate change, sexual violence, the COVID-19 pandemic, starvation, and the reverberating effects of urban warfare. And this last factor can be compounded in, con compounded in conflicts that are protracted. And I mention this as we observe increasingly protracted conflicts. Um, Notably, the ICRC's presence in the top 10 contexts where it has operations is now over an average of 44 years in length. Um, and children living in those conflicts have never known anything else. And perhaps that's true for, for generations in some contexts. So to look at, at some of the, of the very concrete impacts that conflicts have on children. One that we've already talked a lot about is recruitment by armed forces or armed groups. Um, there's also displacements, which um, makes children more likely to be separated from their families and exposes them to other risks. As I mentioned in the last slide, they're more likely um, proportionally to be killed or wounded or maimed during armed conflict than uh, as compared to casualties overall. Um, they're also at risk of detention and the ICRC has seen an increase in detention of very young children in armed conflict. They're at risk of sexual violence and forced labor and they're at risk of family separation, which in turn increases other risks, um, and makes them less likely to have access to basic services and less likely to have access to um, humanitarian assistance. It also increases the likelihood that they will resort to harmful coping mechanisms such as transactional sex. Um, they're also more likely to suffer trauma than adults. And that trauma is more likely to express itself with um, psychosomatic symptoms. Um, it can also be expressed through increased anger, sleep disturbance, um, and, and changes in how they socialize. Uh, children also are at risk when conflict causes societal disruption or economic collapse. Um, relatedly, they're at risk of falling into proper poverty. And um, they're also at risk where um, civilian infrastructure is destroyed during armed conflict, um, which can be related to the risk of, of disruption of basic services, including education, and also healthcare, access to food, access to water, and other essential services. Um, children are more at risk of dying from preventable illness during armed conflict and suffering from malnutrition. They're also more at risk of suffering from stress and other mental health and psychosocial challenges. Um, they may lose access to education. That's something that both adults and children frequently cite as a need during armed conflict. And they may suffer from limited access to humanitarian aid. Again, 
And this is this risk is increased when they're separated from their families. And these risks are really interrelated, they're complex, um, and they're risks that the ICRC sees again and again in its needs, needs assessment and in talking to children themselves. Another risk or impact that's not listed here is um, the fact that children are disproportionately affected by un the unregulated or illegal use of weapons from small arms to landmines to cluster munitions. And in fact, unexploded ordnance are particularly dangerous for children who might be tempted to play with them or to collect them for cycling or for other uses. And it's important to, to be conscious of these these risks as they um, may last a lifetime and they may um, give rise to what's often called a, lot, called a lost generation where children are de deprived of their right to experience childhood. And these risks and needs really are specific to children. And, and as I said in the, in the beginning, it's important not to think of children as small adults, but to recognize the specific needs that children have and the specific right that they have to enjoy a childhood. Um, so I'd like to, to stop here to leave some time for, for your comments and questions. Um, so maybe I will hand back over to, to Christian to, to um, read some of your comments from, from the chat. Well, first, I want to thank you, Ellen, um, very much for taking the time to share all this information with us. With us. I know I found it extremely interesting. Um, and, it's really, and it's such an important topic um, because I think children are something, um, like many things in armed conflict that are often, um, you know, not the priority that they are, don't receive the attention that uh, they deserve, um, similar to other topics that maybe should take less precedent, for example. But, um, the first question that I had, because I know there's some people on the, on the call who, you know, don't have a legal background. Some of them, you know, aren't one of the American Red Cross certified IHL instructors. So that they might have a, a, a confusion because earlier you said the United States isn't, they haven't ratified uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, but they, they've signed it. So I guess mm -hmm. my, maybe you can um, tell us just like, maybe what's, what's the difference between those terms, two terms, and then is there anything that you know, it just being a signatory, does that place any maybe soft obligations on a party to um, maybe refrain from doing something? Or it, can it have any help at all to at least say, well, you signed it, um, even if you haven't ratified it? Yeah. Um, so when a, when a state signs a, a treaty, it's, it's signifying its, its intent to, to join the treaty. And when it's ratified, that that's when the state legally joins the treaty. It often um, involves being going through a process in domestic law, and in the U.S., that that's where the Senate gives its advice and consent, and and it has to to be uh, to go through our our dual system of both the the executive and the the legislative branch um, to incorporate it into U.S. law and to join it and to join the treaty formally. But signatories to a treaty have a duty not to um, undermine the object and purpose of the treaty. So they can't act in contravention of the treaty. Um, and here specifically with the conventions on, on the rights of the child, I think the, the George W. Bush administration expressed some concerns with how that convention would interact with US domestic law, specifically on privacy and on family rights. But that administration and subsequent administrations have expressed their their desire to adhere to the to the spirit of the of the treaty and to to comply with the rules that are compatible with with U.S. law. And as I said, they're a, me a member of the optional protocol, so it's it's a um, it's a little bit of a distinction without a difference. But it's it's one that comes up because it's often cited that the U.S. is the only non-member state. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, we, so we had a really interesting question in um, the Q&A uh, that I wanted to bring up first, which was, which risks of armed conflict upon children have you seen as having gender different, differentiated effects? That is, do some affect girls more than boys? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I, I want to be careful because I don't have statistics right at, at the tip of my fingers. I know that, that there are some that, that are sort of anecdotal that I can, that I can talk about. Um, I, there's sort of a myth that, that uh, gender-based and sexual violence only affects girls when it in fact affects girls and boys. Um, there may be additional stigma that attaches to girls who are subject to sexual violence, in particular if they fall pregnant or if they return to their communities with a child that um, was born of sexual violence. Um, I know that that some of the, the studies on um, disaggregation of harm have pointed out that, that men and boys are more likely to suffer harm from unexploded ordinance and and um, uh, and landmines and the like because they're more uh, likely to to trigger those. But but that also women who are collecting firewood and sent out to collect water have are victims of that. Um, boys can be at a higher risk of being recruited as child soldiers. That's when that. Um, that has a, a definite gender impact, but we also want to highlight that that girls who are recruited, their needs have been sort of ignored because of that disparity for a long time. So while there is a, a gender differential, it's important to treat both boys and girls who have been recruited by armed groups as victims and to provide them with assistance. So hopefully that answers the question a little bit. There's definitely more information and more concrete numbers um, out there. And a lot of it is in that edition of the International Review that yeah. I can share a link to. Um, we had a, to follow up on that, uh, there was, there was a, a que another question about gender-based violence, about a specific geographical situation, but rather than make it a, a personal situation, um, so, so we don't, uh, so the ICRC can maintain neutrality in all its um, information <laughs> that it's giving. Um, maybe you could tell us like, may, what is the ICRC doing like to come to maybe put, to help with victims of gender-based violence? Or, or, or what is the opinion maybe that, you know, what can states do or what can humanitarian agencies do to address um, that tragic situation that occurs? Mm -hmm. So I think first and foremost, prevention is is the most important thing, um, and that can involve um, incorporation into domestic law. There's also some important research that some of my colleagues are doing on how to influence fighters um, in terms of, of discouraging participation in sexual violence. Um, it's coming from the same group that did this, the study on norms of restraint, uh, roots of restraint in war that came out a few years ago. And I think that that study will be published in the coming year or so um, on how to influence uh, potential perpetrators of sexual violence to prevent sexual violence. Um, in terms of assisting victims, the one of the the main things that that's difficult is um, social stigma associated with sexual violence. And there, um, the ICRC and national societies and others provide mental health and psychosocial support, um, particularly to children um, and, and assistance in reintegrating in communities is definitely, it definitely incorporates that. Um, it all, we also provide general health care and, and, and obstetrics care also, which I'm pronouncing terribly. Um, and here I've just gotten the, the link to this edition that I've mentioned a few times and I want to share it in the chat. So that's now there. And we've had a, a, a multiple comments uh, about, uh, just about mental health in general and mental health specifically, are there any mental health recovery programs for youth who survived armed conflicts, crimes and trauma? Does the ICRC offer a 211 type of helpless for services? 
Mm. So I'm not a mental health expert, and I, so I'm, I'm don't I'm not sure uh, what a two one one system is. I know that we do provide mental health ser- services, and we have specialists who are providing that. Um, in context, we also will train mental health professionals um, who are uh, who are working in a particular context already and provide support that way. Um, and it's definitely an issue that has gotten not enough attention in the past and is, and awareness has been raised, especially by the Red Cross movement in recent years, as you can see from the resolutions of our recent uh, international conferences. Um, the next question touches more on cult, like uh, accountability. So maybe it's more of an international criminal law question, but it, the question mm-hmm. is when, if ever, are children treated as adults in criminal proceedings arising from their participation in armed conflict? Um, perhaps mm-hmm. you know any examples to give. Yeah. So at the, the, we talked about the minimum age for recruitment, and, and I think there's another minimum age that's important both in domestic law and at the international level and in international tribunals and the, the ICC, and that's the minimum age of criminal responsibility. Um, for the ICRC, it's important that children are viewed primarily as victims and not only as perpetrators, and that where possible, people under the age of 18 are, are not prosecuted as adults. Oftentimes in domestic systems, the, the minimum age will be, will be 14, and that sometimes uh, will depend on how severe the crime is perceived um, under, under domestic law. Uh, whatever crime they're accused of, at the international level, they will look at the age of the person that perpetrated the crime at the time when considering um, where whether to prosecute them as an adult. However, there's recently been a, a case at the ICC where one of the, the defenses that was raised by the defendant was that he was in fact recruited as a child soldier and the ICC did not find that that excused him of all the crimes that he was accused of. Although at the time he was tried, he was an adult. Yeah, and I think that goes back to what you were saying earlier, how, I mean, you discussed not being prosecuted for mere association or membership in the group. Mm -hmm. Um, But I mean, that doesn't excuse people from the actions that they you know, carry out necessarily just because of their age. Um, We Mm -hmm. had some comments in the chat about, you know, how does that, um, when it comes to targeting, for example, um, with child soldiers, the the crime is recruiting the child soldiers, you know, Mm -hmm. it's not necessarily, um, you know, making, turning them into combatants is the the violation itself. So it's not Mm -hmm. really an issue of targeting, et cetera. Same with um, culpability for intentional individual actions. the 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 last question that we have in the QA, Q&A is in addressing and implementing policy regarding the topic of children in war, how does the ICRC manage the differences in the legal ages of majority across the world? Um, and then they go on to say some websites say the age majority across the world ranges from age 15 to age 21, depending on the particular country. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Yeah. And here there's a uh, in the the customary law study, what what we found was that the the customary legal prohibitions might differ depending on the the treaty that's applicable in a given territory, right? So that's a that's an interesting point. Um, but for the purposes of the ICRC, we we consider everyone under the age of eighteen to be a child for our work, um, and that makes it simpler for us. Uh, but also, it's uh, it's you know, towards the general trend of raising the age in international instruments towards 18. Um, And then uh, we did get a a question in the chat just about when it does come to, uh, you know, the question phrases it as, uh, what what does IHL say about targeting children bearing arms? Um, So like, that's the question, but um, I guess, what's your opinion on that, especially in the sense, like, say the intelligence shows that they are members of 
either a state military as child soldiers, et cetera. Um, what does IHL say about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you sort of said a minute ago, Christian, the, the crime is the recruitment and the use of the child soldiers. Then uh, once they're being used in active combat, to the extent that the opposing forces may know or have the time to understand that they're children, I, that's that's a, a question that's sometimes lost in the fog of war. It's possibly not. And in that case, would they have committed a violation of IHL in targeting that child? I, probably not, right? They would have been targeting an enemy force, a, a combatant. Um, the trick comes when they're they're captured. Uh, they have not lost their status as children because they've been used by an armed force or an armed group. They're still a child and still entitled to protections as a child once they're detained. Um, and that's that's a bit the the brief sort of quick and dirty answer is that you, they may not know. Um, that they're a child and, and therefore it's probably not a violation of IHL to target a combatant who's a child, but once captured, they're a child and must be in, uh, afforded the protections they're entitled to. Oh, thank you. Um, and yeah, so I think that's all the, the, the questions that we have in the Q&A, if there aren't any more, but um, please put them in the chat or the Q&A now. But um, while we wait, oh, if you... Um, uh, somebody had their hand up, but it went down. But uh, Ellen, I, while we wait to see if there's any more questions, I just want to say thank you again uh, for spending your evening um, all the way in, in Europe. Thank you for spending your evening with us and teaching us and discussing this very important topic. I know I learned a lot and, and I know that other people did too based on the, the, the feedback and the engagement that we received following it. So thank you again. And um, I hope to hear you speak on the subject more. Actually, we just had a question come come in again so sorry yeah but uh, I, I think it's kind of a good one uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's say the the juvenile is captured would it because you you mentioned well this goes back to your question about when you, when they do surrender themselves etc that they you know we label them as mm -hmm. child you know that's their status they are they like children POWs the question is when the juvenile is captured are they POWs and then mm -hmm. therefore must they be segregated Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and so the short answer is yes. So the when um, when a, a child who's being used by an armed force and armed group is captured, they they may be detained, and in the context of international armed conflict, they would be a prisoner of war. Um, and children who are detained whether it's prisoners of war or whether they're detained in a non-international armed conflict because of their conduct or if they're detained with their because of their with their family or if they're detained if they're born in detention um, there's many situations where a child may end up in detention and they should be separated from adults unless they're being detained with their family as a family unit unit yeah And we got what we have one more question and I think it's a good way to to finish us off is are there any hopeful upbeat signs slash trends in this area. Mm -hmm. So I think a, a hopeful sign is that there is less recruitment of children by state armed forces um, and and I think we can see every time a child is released by an armed force or an armed group where they have been recruited that's a positive sign um, and I think every year the ICRC and um, national societies like the American Red Cross are able to reunite children who have been separated from their families and those are always the happiest stories we get to see every every year. That's an extremely positive thing. Yeah, it, it, it really is. Um, so I just wanna say thank you again. Um, this time we'll, we'll close out and um, thank you again, Ellen. Uh, I'm gonna put my email in the chat, Ellen, if it's okay, if people have questions, mm -hmm. they can email me and I'll, if you don't mind, I'll pass those over to you um, and you can answer those as they come in if that's all right.
Excellent. Thanks, Christian. And thanks for thanks so much for having me today. And thanks to everybody who took their lunch to, to learn about children in war. Yep. Thank you. Everyone have a great rest of your day or uh, night in Ellen's case. Thank you. Thanks.